you're listening to Sustainably Geeky, episode 59. Today, I am joined by Eugene Stevens, for one, who is, you may have um, seen him on other shows on the channel. He is uh, the quote-unquote godfather of Epically Geeky, and that's our parent show that Sustainably Geeky falls under. So Eugene is here today because he's very interested in the topic we're going to talk about. Um, And we also have Elizabeth Chamberlain. Um, And Liz is the Director of Sustainability for iFixit, the free repair manual with 90,000 guides for how to fix everything from toasters to tractors. She heads the iFixit advocacy team fighting for laws and regulations that will make it easier to fix stuff around the world. So Liz, thank you so much for joining us. Um, We are going to talk about kind of all things repair today. And I'm excited because um, you have a unique background in this field and your job sounds really interesting. So can you start by just telling us a little bit about what you do, how you got into this field, and then kind of what is the origin story for iFixit? Yeah, absolutely. Um, Yeah, so my my job primarily is pushing for right to repair laws and regulations, as you said. Um, iFixit is a big driver in that work. So right to repair is the idea that we should be able to fix everything we own. And that's really core to iFixit's mission, which is teaching everyone how to repair everything. Uh, my background is kind of weird. I, uh, I'm actually a former rhetoric professor. I was an English professor in Arkansas for five years. I, uh, I got a PhD in rhetoric and composition. Um, but between my master's and PhD, I met Kyle, the CEO and co-founder of iFixit. And uh, he, knowing my, my writing enthusiasm, uh, encouraged me to work on a writing project with him, which turned out to be starting the advocacy arm of iFixit. So in 2012 for a year, I was uh, working on blog posts and editorials and so on, learning a lot about e-waste, going to recycling conferences, uh, and sort of, you know, learning about uh, about electronics repair from the, the iFixit ground up. Um, and in the, the time I went away and got my PhD and became a rhetoric professor, I continued to write uh, on a contract basis for iFixit. And about a year and a half ago, the right to repair movement was really taking off and I was feeling really frustrated by humanities academia and uh, iFixit needed a, a person in the role that I'm in now. So it it was kind of a, a perfect time for me to come back and, uh, and support iFixit's continued fight for the right to repair. Yeah, that's really cool. And it uh, really goes to show that, you know, just because you start in one field, um, you can end up doing something completely different. And in this case, advocating for such an important issue, um, which is the right to repair. And we'll talk a little bit more about that um, later in the conversation. Um, So real quick, can you kind of just tell us how iFixit got started? Like what was, was there like one specific concept or product that, you know, a manual was written for and the rest is history? Or or is there more to it than that? (laughs) Uh, yes, yes, and yes. Uh, it, I fix it started in 2003 when Kyle, our co-founder and CEO, was in college and dropped his PowerBook G3 off his dorm room bed, and the power cable uh, bent, the power port bent, and he looked for a guide for how to fix it and couldn't find one. And so he took it apart, and as he did the fix himself, he documented it and wrote a repair manual for the the PowerBook G3. Um, and they found, uh, Kyle and his his roommate, Luke, found that there was a large group of people on the internet with the same problem, wanted to fix Apple stuff. Apple didn't make repair manuals available, didn't make parts available. So they put these guides up online for free uh, and started buying uh, broken Mac products and taking them apart, selling the parts. And that was the the start of iFixit. It's it's kind of the, uh, the seed of everything we still do today. We where our aim is to make repair information freely available, uh, to push manufacturers to make things that they they create more repairable, and uh, teach repair whenever and wherever we can. Well, I've told Eugene this before because he is an avid um, tinkerer and repairer himself, but God bless the people who come up with the videos and the how-to guides and the, the manuals because people like me who you know, are just Googling how to do blah, blah, blah. Um, it really makes a difference and saves you a lot of money and makes you really feel like a sense of accomplishment because you you change this thing or you fix this thing. So um, that's really cool that he, you know, got started that way and, and now it's grown into this big thing. Um, so I guess let's talk about how does the company acquire or develop 
the different tutorials on the website? Yeah. Um, so we've got a team of technical writers, people who write our guides professionally, take pictures for us. Uh, they come from a lot of different backgrounds. So, you know, like me, uh, I fix it hires a lot of people that are from all kinds of places. We have folks on the technical writing team with mechanical engineering backgrounds, of course, but also media design, even philosophy. Um, so mainly we're looking for strong writing skills, good mechanical sense, people who, you know, who feel comfortable taking things apart. Um, so that's, we, we've written about half our guides. I fix it as a wiki. So, uh, Technically, anybody can come on and contribute a guide. They are patrolled. We do have, you know, people with experience going through and making sure that user-submitted guides are uh, are accurate enough. Um, and then about another half-ish of our guides are written by students in the iFixit Technical Writing Project. Uh, we have over 94 universities, uh, or excuse me, I think 94 universities, not over <laughs> 94 universities in the U.S., Canada, Europe. Um, where technical writing students receive a set of devices and uh, toolkits and then write repair guides for those things. And we have a, a, a program that walks students through it and a team of people who, uh, who help review those guides and give students individualized feedback on their writing and their, their photography. I actually did not know about, <clears throat> sorry, I didn't know about that program until I was doing a little research. Jennifer was like, do you have any questions? So, so I was trying to... Trying to figure out some questions so I didn't come on here and sound like an idiot. Um, but yeah, that's fantastic. How did y'all? How did y'all get started? How did y'all tap that as a uh, as a resource? Because it just it makes sense. Uh, one of the the things that anytime I introduce anyone to iFixit is immediately, wow, this is. I, I think I can actually do this because the technical writing is so well laid out. Uh, so it totally makes sense that y'all would y'all would tap you know universities and and find people to to uh, to work on the technical writing. I think a, a big part of it is our close relationship with Cal Poly. Uh, we're we're based in San Luis Obispo with a, a polytechnic university in town. That's where Kyle and Luke were when they started iFixit and where many, many iFixiters uh, came from. Uh, and I my my understanding is that, uh, you know, Kyle took some technical writing classes and thought, you know, actually it would be It'd be great to have something that's a little more useful than, you know, write a guide for how to make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich or something like that, which is a, you know, a common technical writing uh, that, assignment. That's the classical one, yes, yeah. <laughs> um, But I, you know, when I was a rhetoric professor, I actually, I, I used the iFixit technical writing project a couple of times. I had groups of students do it. And I think, uh, you know, Jennifer, the, the experience you were talking about of feeling like, oh, I don't, you know, I don't know if I can do this. And then reading the guide and feeling like, oh, you know what, actually I can do it. That seeing students go through that process was the most amazing thing about the project for me as a, a teacher and that, you know, students would uh, over the course of beginning to take something apart, realize, no, you know what, these are all totally understandable pieces and I can I can do this I can figure this out and even those who you know came into it feeling like oh I'm not technically minded I've never held a screwdriver um, it's not really that hard and I I love that I fix its whole you know whole ethos is you can do it <laughs> we'll we'll help you we'll show you how yeah I think that's great because um the I guess the average person today, you know, doesn't always learn these skills in school as, as much as they used to be taught or even at home. And um, I think we we kind of get, at least I know I do, I get a little self-conscious about, well, you know, I need a specialist to do something or um, I just, a lot of people will just say, I'll just get a new one of whatever right. it is. But um, especially when you're talking about expensive electronics, you don't, <laughs> it's not always an option. So um, having these tools available is is really great. So, um, and speaking of tools, uh, Eugene, did you want to ask about the oh. tools? Because I know you've actually got a, at least one of their kits. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, sitting right here. Cause like I said, I, I had to literally tell Jennifer, I will try not to fangirl out too much on this episode. <laughs> uh, but yes, it's one of their fan. If you're watching the video version, it's one of their fantastic tool sets. Um, was that difficult? I mean, um, <clears throat> I didn't realize that y'all sold parts for as long as y'all did. Um, but was it was that a difficult step deciding, hey, we're going to start making our own tool sets as well? Um, I mean, because, you know, the average, you know, you, you go to the average, you know, uh, uh, hardware store and you can find, you know, 
you know, hex heads, you can find flat heads, you can find Phillips head. But, you know, when you start getting into a five point star with, you know, that's, you know, specific for like a, a Game Boy or whatever, like I can't even imagine where you would go online to look for that. And you know, now it's just like, oh, go to iFixit. They've got it. So, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. So I, I, I think it was kind of a natural growth. We we started by collecting all the tools we loved. You know, in creating guides, we used a bunch of tools. And so the, the first toolkits we sold were uh, collections of tools that we loved from other places in a tool roll. Uh, but of course, we, we quickly realized that we couldn't find exactly what we were looking for. You know, there were things that we loved about the screwdriver, but also things we didn't really like. And <laughs> things that, you know, if we did it ourselves, we'd do better. Um, so I think for, you know, a, a lot of our tool team came through our technical writing team. So these were folks who were using these tools day in and day out, who who just got frustrated with not being able to find exactly what they want. Um, and then of course the the you made the point about the penelope screws, Apple's, you know, five point rounded star. Um, yes. <laughs> uh, and then, you know, this this was sort of the moment where we we knew we had to go beyond just collecting tools that other people had made in the iPhone 4, Apple for the first time secured the bottom with these these two tiny screws shaped a little like a Torx, but not exactly, you know, rounded, a rounded star shape um, that nobody else made. And only mm -hmm. Apple technicians had. And uh, we were lucky in that we had, we had actually picked up our teardown device uh, in Asia where they were sold with uh, with regular Phillips screws. But when they were sold in America, they were sold with sold with the penelobes and you know every model of iPhone since then has had the penelobes. Uh, and so to to get into those devices, we uh, we had to reverse engineer the screwdriver. We sent our you know our tool friends <laughs> uh, version of the screw and said, hey can you can you make a bit that fits this and and help us out and uh, and that that was sort of the start of our um, our you know, our, our, our special toolkits, toolkits that we created ourselves. Well, I have to say they are, it's very clear uh, that they were designed by people who will use them because the, the fit and finish is just second to none. Like you, you pick up the screwdriver and you're just like, nope, this was designed by someone who's obviously using this and not just, you know, rushing it out in a, you know, China factory just to get it out there. So uh, I, I love it. It's, it's hands down one of the, the best sets I've, I've ever owned. So. That's so good to hear. <laughs> um, well, let's talk a little bit about repairability and um, kind of the right to repair movement, like you mentioned earlier. So, you know, the ability to repair uh, can save consumers money, but also give you a sense of, like I mentioned earlier, self-reliance or self-accomplishment. Um, so it's also, you know, I don't think a lot of people realize has a big impact on the environment. So what are the environmental implications of repair and, and how, how are you guys kind of, you know, working to in the work that you do to, you know, reduce those impacts? Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's a great question. And I, the, the impact of electronics manufacturing on the planet is huge and it's at every single stage of the development of electronics from, you know, from the mining to the the refining of metals to the manufacturing to the e-waste, um, at every stage there are toxic byproducts, things that pollute air and water and soil, um, things that you know damage the communities where those things are happening. Um, and at the end of life, you know, we're we have really a growing gigantic pile of e-waste in the world that we haven't figured out what to do with. There is no country in the world that is recycling the majority of its e-waste. Uh, I think the, the best is about 40% and we're only at about 17% in the US. It's not great. Um, but of course, even recycling isn't perfect. Even where we are recycling things, uh, we can only recycle about half of the metals in a smartphone. Uh, and Many metals have functional recycling rates under 50%. So, you know, even of the metals we're collecting, we're not getting all of them. Most plastics can't be recovered at all. Uh, so, you know, the, 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 the impacts of mining, manufacturing, e-waste are huge on the planet. And um, even when we think we're recycling electronics, a lot of times it's really just shipped to a, a developing country where it's dumped on their shores or they are harvesting the stuff out of them in very unsafe conditions and end up sick or dying and <laughs> you know so it's yeah. like a yeah it's not it's not great no matter how you look at it it's 
Yeah. I'm, you know, it's, it's funny cause it's, it's true. That does happen. There are, um, we are shipping electronics around the world, uh, you know, used and used and broken recycled electronics. And there've been plenty of recyclers that have gotten caught, uh, sending out containers of, uh, of broken electronics, uh, instead of properly recycling them. But the, you know, I, I think what has been the biggest surprise to me in learning about e-waste over the last 10 years is that uh, every country at this point is generating e-waste and large amounts of it. You know, there are uh, more mobile phone subscriptions in sub-Saharan Africa than there are people. It's one of my one of my favorite weird surprising stats. Uh, so, you know, every every country around the world is generating e-waste. Every country needs to figure out what to do with it. Uh, and I, I think there has been this sort of global focus on making sure that we're not exporting things. Um, but actually, you know, the U.S. is also importing a bunch of e-waste. We import e-waste from Canada and from Mexico to, to process. Um, so, I, you know, increasingly, I think the focus needs to be less on worrying about where, where e-waste is being sent and worrying more about making sure that every community has some means of dealing with it locally. Um, and, you know, making sure that stuff doesn't get there as much as it uh, as it has been, making sure that we're keeping things around for longer and repair is a huge part of that, extending product lifespans. Absolutely. And um, in a circular economy, repair is a big, a big part of that if we're trying to actually shift from one of just, you know, make, use, dispose, then this actually lets you make new things or, or like you said, let the life the lifespan extend on those items. Um, so uh, let's talk a little bit about planned obsolescence, which is kind of this practice that is becoming more common in, um, I'd say, specifically Western societies, although probably all over the world, um, which is, you know, the idea of um, things being thrown away or, or disposed of in some way before they're actually, you know, their, their useful lifespan is up. Um, and, and I think we see this in a lot of ways, both physical and technical. And you kind of touched on that in, in the examples you gave with Apple, I think, um, making it so that you can't break into their phones or whatever. But can you talk a little bit about this phenomena and how it does contribute to the lack of repairability? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I, I think the Penelope screw is such a perfect example because there's no justification for it outside of keeping people out of their stuff. It's it, literally the only reason to put those screws there is to keep people from opening it up. And, you know, in, in the iPhone, every other screw inside the device is a, a Phillips head. Uh, it's only those only those tiny ones at the um, at the front that are not. Um, but increasingly, we're seeing manufacturers use other sneaky software means of doing this. Um, there's a, a practice called parts pairing where manufacturers will pair a pair apart with software to a device motherboard or device serial number or something and require you to put in uh, put in that serial number, put in a part number into you know maybe a chat function. That's how Apple does it or you know have a, uh, a dealer come out and put in a special code. That's how John Deere does it. Um, but the you know in whatever way it's done, uh, it's software making it so that you need an extra additional step to complete a repair. And that means that, you know, the dealer or the manufacturer can control what repairs you can do. And so, you know, for example, if you want to swap a battery from one iPhone to another, you can't without losing your battery health indicator, without getting warnings that you can't dismiss that are in your, uh, in your, your, your settings, uh, persistently. So, it, you know, I, I think there are the sort of physical things, the screws that that are proprietary or, you know, glued down batteries with you know, batteries glued with industrial strength adhesive and so on um, that are making making repairs physically more difficult. And uh, even as those things, you know, begin to be resisted by legislation and by consumer pushback, manufacturers are finding other ways to keep us out of their stuff. Yeah, I know for me personally, I experienced have experienced like, um, you know, I didn't want to upgrade my Windows or, or Microsoft or something, but I was forced to because it wouldn't be supported and I wouldn't get updates and then it would stop working. Or, you know, on my phone, I, um, I've i had the same phone since like 2018 technically, but I had to actually send it in for a refurbished phone because one little part went bad, the, the charging port went bad and they said, oh, well, we can't fix it. You have to get a new one. And 
I was covered by insurance, but the yeah. point was like, this phone technically should have kept working. And had I known about iFixit and had access to some of those tools, I, I actually think I looked up that problem on your website um, a few days ago just to see if it was there and it was how to fix it. So I probably could have fixed it myself had I known. But um, yeah, I think it's it's big education for a lot of people just knowing like what the company tells us isn't always the case and we can actually take back some of that, yeah. <laughs> that power on a lot of those things. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think that's a perfect example because so often manufacturers will tell you that something is unrepairable. And mm -hmm. so rarely is that actually true. It you know, really just means that it's uh, it's harder for them to do it or it's more profitable for them to push you onto a new thing. Um, mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's frustrating. Yeah. It's funny you say that about the batteries too, because I remember a few phones ago, I could get like an external battery and switch them out and whatever and it was fine and then like the next model up they stopped doing that and I was like oh that's weird and never occurred to me that was you know <laughs> intentional <laughs> yeah oh um okay so you know knowing that that companies are doing these sneaky things and and kind of playing into um you know not just these technical uh and physical and technical issues but like knowing that people want the newest coolest thing they always want an upgrade they always want the, the the next model right so that's another form of of plan obsolescence i think um and and that this offers them kind of this reliable income stream um and having something that's a little more durable and repairable maybe negatively impacts their income what are some ways that companies can continue to stay in business without having to constantly you know produce a newer model because in capitalism it's always more 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 new 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 but obviously that's not sustainable yeah um i mean i think as companies are recognizing that right to repair laws are going to force them to sell parts and tools uh many of them are uh waking up to the potential revenue there and looking for ways that they can uh, can they can make money in the aftermarket's parts business and you know, I, I think that's what's happened in the car space uh, as, you know, as manufacturers have not been able to restrict repair to their own dealer networks. One of the ways that they recoup some of that potential income is by selling parts. Um, and we've uh, 20 years ago when we were pushing manufacturers to become more repairable, to make things more repairably, uh, manufacturers weren't interested in it. They weren't they wouldn't give us the time of day. but Increasingly, manufacturers are actually coming to us and saying, you know, we're seeing this is happening. We know that things are changing. Can you help us become more repairable? And uh, that's how we have become the official repair parts provider for Google Samsung, or excuse me, <laughs> Google Pixel and Samsung Galaxy phones. Um, but even, you know, outside of those partnerships, Apple has started a, a, a do-it-yourself repair service where you can put in your device IMEI and what part you want and they will ship it to you for you know the latest models of iPhones uh, and M1 Max and it you know I, I think uh, maybe I you know no manufacturers are publishing their numbers about uh, how much they're making through planned obsolescence but it seems to me like that's a, a, a pretty smart way to recoup some of that mm-hmm yeah, because um, heaven forbid they have to make a little bit less money, right? <laughs> Just slightly less. Um, so, uh, yeah, we've talked about this right to repair movement. And uh, can you give us a little bit more information about what it is and how iFixit is helping to move it forward? Yeah, yeah. So as I, I said before that the right to repair is basically the idea that you should be able to fix everything you own. And right to repair legislation around the world gets at different pieces of that, different slices of it. And we have to slice it by uh, domain sometimes. So some of our laws are looking at smartphones and computers, and some are looking at tractors, and some are looking at medical equipment. Um, uh, and we're also looking at other things that block repair, like copyright laws that are sort of outdated and don't make any sense in the context of repair. Um, uh, I fix its role is, uh, you know, we're 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 in it at a, a bunch of different levels. Um, our co-founder, uh, he he met the head of the repair association 
uh, Gay Gordon Byrne at a conference in 2014, and they started talking about their frustrations with repair. She had come out of the um, the like network equipment industry. She sold network equipment and was really frustrated by not being able to get parts, tools, documentation for that sort of thing. And uh, she she had embarked on a sort of retirement project of documenting all of the different models of server equipment and you know accounting for it what what breaks and how and how much are we wasting by having all this stuff break um and they they met somebody else at this conference that had just worked on the automotive right to repair bill in massachusetts which passed to enable uh enable independent shops and consumers to get access to parts, tools, and documentation for cars. Uh, and Kyle and Gase said, wow, that's a that's a great idea. We should do the same thing for electronics. And the very first right to repair bill, uh, they they actually took the text from the, the Massachusetts bill and, uh, you know, find and replaced uh, cars with electronics. That one did not pass, but now, uh, whatever that was 2015 so we're now eight years later uh and we've had right to repair bills in uh i think 46 of 50 u.s states uh and there are right to repair for reforms that have passed in europe bills that are being considered in canada and india and australia um so it's really it's a it's a movement that's growing legs um but i fix it was kind of at the start of it and we are we're still very deeply involved um you know, often talking to legislators about what all this means and just trying to educate on the topic, educate on what problems consumers are seeing. Um, and in some cases, more actively involved, like we are co-sponsors of the California bill, for instance. So un recognizing that, sorry, uh, Eugene, recognizing okay. that you guys are uh, mostly working in the U.S., it sounds like, um, is there a country or countries around the world that, you know, you look to as models or that if people wanted to to research more, to find out like who's doing it right, where where should they look? Um, different reforms have happened in different places. So uh, I think one of the most exciting reforms recently in December, the EU passed a battery directive that will require manufacturers to make batteries user replaceable by 2026 or 2027, depending on when exactly it goes into effect. Um, but that's super exciting because that is such a huge problem. The, the most common problem with uh, with electronic devices is batteries going bad, and you know batteries are consumables. They have a a, a lifespan that's usually shorter than people want to keep their stuff around. Um, so that's that's a huge reform. It's a big deal, and I think you know partly the success that they've had in Europe with with that sort of bill comes because there's uh, there's more receptiveness to the environmental argument there than than we see in the U.S. Um, but nevertheless. Uh, there, there has been some success in the U.S. Also, we passed the uh, the first ever electronics right to repair bill in New York, also in December, actually. Um, and that wasn't exactly the bill we wanted. There are ways in which we hoped it would be better, uh, but it, you know, it's it's a starting point, and we're pushing bills across the country, across the world, um, that that will improve in the places where New York was not quite what we wanted. I was going to say, you know, geeks and, and uh, tinkerers like myself, uh, uh, you, know, you know, the handyman around the house, uh, you know, a lot of people who are interested in this type of thing, uh, like me, know about the right to repair. Um, most people don't, and yet, and then occasionally we get something that hits the media that all of a sudden people start realizing, and the biggest one that recently it seemed, for most people that I've talked to, is the uh, ice cream machines at McDonald's. Everyone's like, why Why do we need Congress to talk about this? And it's like, because the reason they're not getting fixed is because they can't fix them. They won't let them fix them. And when I started explaining that, they're like, I never thought about that. And so I was wondering, is... um. Are there any other really good examples out there of um, ways that uh, uh, restricting right to repair are affecting, uh, you know, the, the the average user that maybe they don't realize that, you know, we've we've talked about, you know, you talked about batteries, uh, which is you know a big one, like like you said, you know, it, uh, it it you know when battery starts going dead on a phone, that's when usually when a lot of people will replace it, but uh, I think a lot of people just don't realize that. Um, they, it's not. It's maybe not just the fact that 
they don't want to repair it is that you can't repair it for whatever reason. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I, I mean, I think the ice cream machine is such a great example because, you know, anyone who's ever tried to get an ice cream at McDonald's knows that you can't count on that machine to be available. And it, it seems crazy that, you know, people in a McDonald's can't fix it themselves. Uh, it seems crazy that there's, you know, for all the other documentation of all the other machines they have, that's that one can't be fixed by people in the in the store. Um, I, one other, I don't know, sort of powerful example that we've seen um, at the beginning of the pandemic, we started to hear from uh, hospital technicians around the world that they had ventilators that, you know, were sitting unrepaired in back rooms and they wanted to be able to get those ventilators back on online. But, you know, of course, manufacturer technicians were overwhelmed. They couldn't get to everything. Uh, and there were these these service contracts that restricted repair that meant that, you know, technically uh, they were supposed to wait, call and wait for the manufacturers to come and come and fix those things. And repair manuals weren't available. Even, you know, most hospitals have technicians who are pretty handy, pretty comfortable doing repairs, but they weren't they weren't allowed to touch those things. Um, and so, you know, as so many the pandemic made it so that we were able to push past so many uh, so many regulations that were otherwise sort of stifling things. Um, and we we had technicians mail us or, you know, mail or, or email us ventilator repair manuals. And we put up a bunch of them online. And we we heard then afterward from a lot of ventilator technicians that were able to get machines up and running when they weren't previously. Um, so, you know, I, I, in the time since then, we've started to get some takedown notices from medical device manufacturers, but the, uh, the Electronic Frontier Foundation has helped us fight those, fight those takedown notices so far successfully. But it's, it's a case that, you know, really sort of opened my eyes to the, the, that problem in the medical device world. It's not just ventilators, of course. There are so many medical devices in exactly the same position where, you know, they could be saving lives. There are people who are well trained with lots of experience on this equipment that would be happy to try to fix those things, but they can't because of, you know, restrictions and contracts with uh, with medical device manufacturers. So voiding you know. their warranties. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. Well, remember yeah. there was a big push. I'm I'm really big into 3D printing, and there was a. I remember there being a big push in the 3D printing community. It's like, hey, these ventilators need parts. If you have a the 3D printer that's sitting around not doing anything, we could sure use use your help. And I I 3D print some stuff and sent it out to, uh, awesome. you know, it's like, hey, send it to you know this place and we'll get it to where it's going and everything. So. Uh, same thing for masks. Like people were, you know, just, there were thousands of different designs for masks, and uh, I even, you know, did some of them in the early stages. Um, that's one of the things. I, like I said, I'm, I'm a really big, I'm really big into 3D printing, um, and it's one of those things that was when I first learned about 3D printing, I was so hopeful that the companies that had no interest in um, keeping up with old parts, old legacy parts, and I understand, you know, that that does cost money on them. They have to keep a a warehouse with these old parts that they may or may not ever sell. And I always, I, I was always hoping that we might one day see, well, Hey, we're not going to support this anymore. Here's the plans for it. If you need a part, go make it yourself. And yeah. that would just, that would be fantastic because we wouldn't have to have warehouses full of parts that may or may never get used. It's, you know, kind of a, I need it. I make it, I use it. And, and do do you ever, do you see that? coming to fruition even in our lifetimes or do you think companies are just going to be so steadfast to either we make it or it doesn't get made yeah um i mean there's definitely a lot of a lot of push toward that on the the tinker repairer side uh there's a um a design group at tu delft uh that's that's working on exactly that question of you know what can we 3d print how can we uh, how can we make it so that repair parts as a system uh, works as you described, where, you know, the designs are made available and people can produce them on the fly instead of having to overproduce uh, questionable amounts of things and warehouse them and ship them and, you know, all of the, the waste and, uh, and, and overhead that that requires. So, I, you know, I, I think there's a lot of a lot of interest at that side. I've also heard from um, 
folks in the appliance repair world, uh, you know, it's it's a common story in appliance repair that something, some some particular piece goes bad on thousands and thousands of machines all at once. And the manufacturer hasn't prepared, you know, they did a 10% parts overrun or something like that. And they're not prepared. They won't be prepared for another two years or five years or something to be able to meet that demand. And so, you know, people will have a brand new fridge with a permanently busted ice maker, that sort of thing. Very common story. Um, And appliance repair technicians uh, are uh, reverse engineering those things, you know, creating the parts themselves, selling them. And I think as long as manufacturers uh, aren't able to meet that demand themselves, often they're kind of turning a blind eye to that. Um, But it it does feel like that should be the system, (laughs) you know, and 3D printing is getting to the place where it's, it's so much more widely available, so much more, you know, reliable. Um, it, It seems to me like that should be the near future. I hope it is. I'm keeping my fingers crossed. <laughs> Me too. Me too. <laughs> yeah, you mentioned something that I'm curious about, um, that you had a, a takedown order from, you know, some of these companies. How often do you all get pushback or even like lawsuits, if you're able to talk about that, from some of these companies that where you're publishing or even selling tools um, to fix things that they are trying to restrict? I mean, is there... Do, do they have legal standing to, to come after you guys or is it kind of just like free market, you know, we're, we're selling things that you aren't, I mean, is it, what does that look like? Um, we've had pushback from medical device manufacturers for those manuals that we've published. Uh, that's really the only case where we have, we've published uh, PDFs directly from, you know, manufacturer repair mm-hmm. manuals. Uh all, all of our other 90,000 repair guides, we either we have created or, you know, we've, we've had teams create. Um, and in, in those cases, manufacturers have no leg to stand on because, you know, any any procedure that can be d- divined from opening something up and figuring it out yourself can't be protected. There's no there's no legal protection for uh or something that you can figure out by opening up something in your pocket. So uh, we we largely haven't had uh, manufacturers push back about those sorts of things. The only sort of pushback we've had is about um, teardowns we've done, you know, before devices were out. There have been some some disagreements about what the expectation was <laughs> uh, about whether whether or not we'd take something apart. But um, you know, when it comes to repair manuals. Uh, you know, we're we're doing what anybody could do if they opened something up, figured it out, took it apart themselves. Um, and similarly with tools, you know, we're reverse engineering is uh, uh, a, a perfectly reasonable way to, to make tools <laughs> legally. Yeah. Wow. So you guys are um, pretty busy and uh, you don't doing a lot of great work. Um, is there anything we haven't touched on that you guys do or, or just about repair in general that you'd want to, you know, talk about before we. Hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, you know, I'm not, nothing's coming to my mind quickly. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> no worries. Eugene, did you have any other questions for her while we're. All I can think of is um, it, it seems to me, it seems within the last, I don't know, at least maybe the last, decade decade and a half um and i I really think i have to credit uh youtube for that uh i really think youtube is going to be when it comes down to it will be a great resource in human history just because um uh, i'll be honest there i didn't realize that y'all had repair manuals on uh, a lot of appliances and stuff uh so a lot of times the first place i'd go would be youtube to look for stuff because um but anyway back to what my original thing was uh it, it seems like within the last decade or so uh the the rise of the DIY you know DIYer and the rise of the well, I'm going I can take this apart and I can give this a shot to fix it seems like it's really kind of started picking up steam before then you know uh, I work in education and and not having shop class and not having home economics be common things anymore uh it seems like we there was a, a long period of time where it was just kind of expected oh well if it breaks you you either hire someone to do it or you you throw it out and buy a new one. And uh, for me, I, the way I see it, it, it seems like more and more people are willing 
to take it apart and give it a shot and everything else. Are y'all, do y'all see that as well or? Absolutely. Yeah. I, I think you're pointing to YouTube is really smart. Um, it, it's true. YouTube is a, a huge resource for repair and, you know, we, we have some appliance repair manuals, but I, I go to YouTube first when I'm looking for appliance repair. I fix its best coverage is in, in gadgets. Um, oh, we're, yeah. we're working on, working on other things too, but, um, but you know, we found that our audience actually has moved increasingly to YouTube. You know, we, we used to be sort of blog focused primarily in, in the way we were putting out information and telling people when we'd released guides and, uh, and tear downs and so on. Uh, and now most of our audience is on YouTube and, increasingly uh on tiktok too and that's that's been a, a shift for us you know we're uh mostly millennials learning how to <laughs> learning how to work with the gen zers <laughs> adapt to the changing social media i yeah. I, I don't i'm sorry i'm 45 i don't see pulling up tiktok to watch a a, a you know three and a, or you know two minute video on how to pull apart my macbook like i'm sorry i want i want it <laughs> on a screen and i want step by step with pictures like iFixit does, which I, I can't say enough how fantastic y'all's guides are. Um, Thank you. The fact that there are pictures, the fact that it's written, and and the fact that it literally starts off with, this is the degree of difficulty. So this is super easy. Anyone can do this to, hey, maybe this shouldn't be the first thing you start with. <laughs> right, right. This is not so, repair one. <laughs> yeah, this is, yeah. yeah, don't pull your your Mac Mini all the way apart down to its, oh, even though the Mac Mini was is a, is a fantastic, I have one, right. I have an M1 right now. I freaking love it. But the one I had before, it was infinitely more repairable. Like, yeah. I upgraded everything in it, and now all of the chips are soldered onto it. And, I mean, I know how to solder, but I don't want to unsolder chips on a board. <laughs> Agreed. So, yeah. Yeah. We, you know, we, we, uh, we have micro soldering resources. Actually, we've got a full micro soldering course on YouTube, um, mm -hmm. that's sponsored by, uh, by Jessa Jones, who's the, uh, iPad rehab founder who started micro soldering when she, her kids dropped her iPhone in a toilet and she, uh, <laughs> she recovered it, uh, <laughs> by breaking out her microscope. Um, but you know, I, I think it's true that the, vast majority of people are not willing to break out the microscope to do a repair and that's that's okay uh there are people out there like jessa jones that will you know like ruth lewis rossman that will um uh but uh you know absolutely i think uh you know it's getting the information in the hands of the people in the way that they want it and that that way is increasingly video uh is uh it's, it's hugely important to making repair accessible to people I wonder if the um, increased uh, return to repair or interest in kind of DIY stuff it also, you know, seems to go hand in hand with people who are starting to want to, you know, craft more, make their own clothing and make, um, I don't know, sourdough starters or just do more things where they felt like more self-sufficient and, and it all kind of goes hand in hand. Like there seems to be a mind shift or a mindset shift um, in society as a whole to where we are more comfortable trying out these things that used to be commonplace and almost not accepting that like, you know, I can't do this, I guess. And, and, and yeah. maybe the internet has a lot to do with that, but it's interesting. No, I think you're right. I think, I think there's a bit of a pendulum swing back. You know, we had this, had this move toward this sort of sealed box, you know, everything, mm -hmm. everything just functions and you're not supposed to think about it. Uh, and it does feel to me like we're we're swinging back towards, uh, you know, towards tinkering, towards mm -hmm. figuring out how your stuff works and, you know, figuring out how to fix it yourself, whether that's clothes yeah. or sourdough starters. And hopefully that translates into, um, you know, kind of another old, I guess, old fashioned, quote unquote, mindset of buy nicer things that might cost more instead of a lot of things that are cheaply made that it actually ends up costing you more over the life of the product because you're having to buy so many. So um, something that you're, you're going to invest in and you may have to repair a few times, but it's not going to produce as much waste and um, save you money in the long run, I guess. Absolutely. <laughs> Overall. Um, well, we've talked about YouTube. Are there any other resources you would share with our listeners that want to learn more about um, repair or, you know, the work that you guys are doing? Yeah. Um, there's a, uh... We've we've got some friends over at Secure Repairs. They're a, a group of 
uh, security professionals that advocate for the right to repair that do a really great job of uh, keeping up with all of the right to repair news. And there's a huge amount of it, which is wonderful and exciting, but also uh, hard to keep up with without them. Uh, so the, the I would recommend the fight to repair newsletter. And that's that's through secure repairs. Um, and then there are a couple of other things. Um, there's a, a book called Made to Break and a, a documentary called The Light Bulb Conspiracy, both of which are sort of great introductions to the history of planned obsolescence. And, you know, I, I think you can't come away from reading Made to Break, watching The Light Bulb Conspiracy without realizing that this is this is very deliberate strategy. This is not an accident. We didn't get here. Uh, we didn't slip and get here. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, those are great. And we'll link to um, those resources in our show notes as well, if anyone's interested in following up with that. Um, Eugene, did you have any other questions before we move on? Or Not that I can think of. Like I said, Listen. I could probably keep sitting here and, and <laughs> gushing. Uh, I, yeah, it's uh, thank you so much for, for what y'all do. Like it really, it, I, I'm a, I work at a high school. My job has really shifted away from being able to do repairs. But when I first started it, we, we did repair computers and I, do, I have, I am trained in computer maintenance. That was my uh, associate's degree. Uh, so seeing a lot of the movement kind of move from being able to just, you know, rip anything apart and, and replace it and repair it to everything being soldered on has, has been heartbreaking for me. Um, but being able to go online and be like, oh, no, here's how you get around that. And it's <laughs> it it makes my little engineer heart uh, happy to to be able to to see that that's that's the case. Um, but, yeah, like I I, I I use the site constantly. Uh, last week I had to open up an Xbox controller because I pushed on the controller too hard. I'm like, no, you dropped it, obviously, that because I don't <laughs> see how you got the button mashed in that hard anyway. But, yes, it's it's literally just a quick. Over, I fix it, and yeah, here's three steps how to do it real quick. And all right, here you go. Here's your controller. Now I don't have to spend another, you know, sixty dollars on a controller. Like you know, it's that would be ridiculous to spend sixty dollars on a controller that it took me five minutes to repair. Exactly. Exactly. So awesome. Well, let's uh, move on to our green life hack section of the show, and this is where we um, share with listeners one or two things that they can do to make their lives a little more sustainable or just, you know, educate themselves on, on things that are um, affecting the world around them. Um, so Elizabeth, would you like to go first? Sure. Yeah. Um, so I have sort of two related tips. Uh, and the main one is that I think the biggest shift that we need to go through as consumers is thinking about repair, not just when things break, but also when we're buying things. So think mm -hmm. about, you know, think making sure that the things that we buy are repairable, can be fixed when they break, uh, and demanding that of manufacturers. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, there are companies that are really thinking about this from the ground up. Um, there's uh, there's a, a computer company called Framework that makes computers that are fully repairable, that have, you know, links to repair guides with QR codes on each part. It comes with the one screwdriver you need to take it apart. Um, we also produce uh, uh, some repairability buying guides. We have a smartphone, laptop, uh, and tablet repairability guides that uh, that rank different models of phones and smartphones and uh, laptops on repairability to make it easier to, to find things that will be easier to fix when they break. Mm. Um, and then sort of the, the other side of that is that when something does break, you have to be willing to fix it and, and think about, you know, when the battery dies, think about replacing the battery and not about replacing the thing. Yeah, I love that. And um, I think, yeah, it's one thing to say, make things more repairable, but actually thinking through, will I be able and willing to do it? Um, and, and ranking, like you said, that could be the, all other things equal, the, the thing that tips someone over to one model or the other is whether or not it's it's fixable <laughs> or the parts are accessible, et cetera. So it's a great tips. Um, Eugene, do you have a green life hack for us? Uh, yeah, it's pretty much going to be the exact same green hack, green life hack I've <laughs> had every time I've ever been on this show. Okay. Um, and that goes even back to, I think episode one, I think I was on the first episode. Um, yeah, give it a shot. Try to repair it. Uh, it, it is, it is definitely one of the most sustainable things that you can do. And believe me, I was not always this way. Um, you get tired of the dryer 
not working and having to spend $60 to be able to go, you know what, let me see how hard this is and realize that it's a $20 part and it takes maybe, a, maybe an hour or so the first time you do it. But after you, if you've done it a couple of times, it only takes you 20 minutes. It's like, why would I, why would I wait for someone to come and do this? Or, you know, um, I, I know it's technically not true, but one of the, one of the things that I've kind of adopted is, is what are you going to do? Break it more. It's already broken. Give it a shot. Like, um, worst case. Challenge yeah, accepted. <laughs> the, I know. Right. I mean, if nothing else, it's a funny, it's a funny, uh, story to tell the repair guy when he shows up. Um, but yeah, it, give it a shot. Like, and, and, you know, uh, not to sound like I'm gushing, but yes, definitely go check out. I fix it. Go check out, go check out YouTube. Like it's not just cat videos. It's, it's, it, there's so much great knowledge out there on how to fix stuff and how to maintain your own stuff. Uh, that's another thing is learn the maintenance on your stuff. Like sometimes you can avoid it from ever having to be fixed if you can just maintain it. Mm. So, yep. Or you can just make friends like Eugene and call them when you need help with something. Cause he has actually come and looked at my dryer before. <laughs> um, yeah. So yeah, I like that though. Um, I've become a little braver in the things that I try to fix and do myself and not pay a hundred or, you know, however much to, to get someone to come over and do it for me. Um, so in the same theme of the show and your, both of your hacks, mine is also about repair, um, but more geared towards clothing. So um, I am not a person who knows how to use a sewing machine by any stretch of the imagination, but I have, um, you know, learned how to sew a button on and I actually sewed all resewed all of the buttons on a very cheaply made jacket a few months ago um, in the waiting room of a dentist's office for a few hours. Um, I've, you know, had the little tips of the heels on a shoe or a boot come off and I've, I didn't do that myself, but I went and got it repaired. So I guess my challenge is just think about if you can extend the, the life of your clothing, um, whether that's you doing it yourself or taking it somewhere, because a lot of times um, a small little problem like that is, is something that a lot of people would just throw away or donate their clothes, but um, you could actually keep that item that you really like and keep getting wear out of it. If you just, you know, do a little research or ask a friend or, or something, um, that knows how to do that kind of stuff. So, yeah. And then who knows, maybe you'll, you know, get into more extensive things when it comes to sewing and making your own stuff, which I'm not there yet, but <laughs> working on it. So, um, well, thank you again, Liz, for being on the show and, um, sharing your knowledge and, and experience, um, with this important topic. Um, where can we find you and, or I fix it online? I fix Awesome. And I'm assuming all social medias and you said TikTok. Yep. Yep. On YouTube, on TikTok. I think we even have a Pinterest account. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. And Eugene, where can we find you online? Well, Jennifer, you can find me at epicallygeeky.com where we have the other shows that we do, including the Epically Geeky Show, the Marginally Geeky Show, and the Creatively Geeky Show. Uh, and then if you want to follow my individual wacky adventure, you can find me online at Optimus Gene on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Awesome. Um, you can find me here, of course, uh, occasionally on some of the other shows Eugene mentioned and on Instagram and Twitter at Het's Gonna Be Me. And um, you can find the show on all social media platforms as well and YouTube and anywhere you listen to podcasts. So um, if you don't already, please subscribe, share us with a friend, um, five stars, you know, thumbs up, whatever they let you do. Um, we really appreciate it. And if you have ideas for future topics or guests, feel free to send those our way as well. Um, thank you guys for being on and everyone listening. Have a great rest of your day. Mm -hmm.